Welcome everyone to the Berlin Functional Programming Group. I'm pleased to uh, welcome our speaker tonight, Simon Thompson. Simon is a researcher, author, and teacher. He's the author of The Craft of Functional Programming, Haskell, The Craft of Functional Programming. He's one of um, uh, several, uh, in my opinion, famous and highly regarded Haskell Simons. So I'm especially excited to have him join us this evening. He is uh, a researcher at the University of Kent and ELTE Budapest, which I haven't heard of before. So I'm curious to hear about that, the, uh, the transit between Kent and Budapest. His research interests include uh, verification, tool building, testing for Erlang, Haskell, and OCaml. And he currently works with IOHK on Cardano. So we can maybe ask him about these things later. Tonight, he's going to be talking to us about refactoring functional programs. If you have a question for Simon, please type your question into chat. I will try to find a convenient moment to interrupt him and uh, I will allow you to unmute and ask your question yourself. Uh, I, I like to have as many voices as I can uh, so we can assimilate as best as possible the feeling of actually being together in a meetup. If you are unable to use uh, your microphone for some reason, or if you just prefer me to read your question, let me know and I will read your question for you. And um, I, I like to have uh, as many questions as possible, creating a dialogue so, uh, so Simon doesn't feel alone. And so we all feel a little bit connected. So think of some questions. And if you have any final questions to ask about Simon's work in general, I'm sure he would be happy. Well, I, I, ho I hope I can assume he would be happy to entertain them at the end. Yeah, yeah definitely, yes. Great, and I'm going to hand over to you, Simon. And let's see, replace spotlight. Okay. Yeah. And you should be able to- Share my desktop. Go ahead. Okay, and let's go into Keynote. And... Okay, so are you seeing my presentation? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Perfect. Right. Well, I'll start. And thanks again for your invitation. It's a great pleasure to, to be asked to speak. And um, I look forward to the dialogue. So yes, definitely. I, it's a, I, I'm very happy to answer questions as, as things go along. And, and thanks, for, thanks for allowing that to happen. Okay. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Um, I'm going to talk about refactoring. And I I've been involved in developing tools for, um, for refactoring for a number of years. So I'm going to, I want to talk a bit about what goes on in building tool support and tell a particular story there around what we've done with um, refactoring OCaml. And then I want to talk a bit about automated refactoring, you know, uh, it's what its role is and um, what I think about automated refactoring. And then I want to, to answer a couple of, of questions or try to answer a couple of questions about um, if you build tools uh, there are there are um, you, you want people to use them so people ask why should I use your tool what, what's 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 the what are the costs what are the benefits of using your tool and I want to talk a bit about that and a, a, a particular interest there is why you should trust a refactoring tool and um, so I'll I'll try and answer that in, in, and explain what I've been doing in, in that area. And then finally, I want to say something about language independent refactoring. Um, so that's the, that's the very general um, outline. Uh, first of all, I guess there's this question, what do we mean by refactoring? I mean, it could be, it could be something like this. It could be um, a, a one line change in a piece of code or a two line change in a, in a file. That could be a refactoring. Or it could, um, you know, it could involve taking a project like this, um, which is a, you know, a, a dependency graph of a, a, a typical project perhaps, um, or may, maybe rather densely con connected, but nonetheless, it's a, a project might well look, be this complicated. And it's, this could be subject to large scale refactoring. It could be subject to, to changes across um, half a, a number of those modules. So it could be it could be very small, it could be very large. Oops. It could be, oops, sorry, I, I hit my um, let me go back. I um it could be quite crude. 
you know, it could involve um, doing things by hand. You know, there's no, there's nothing precision. Well, I hope there's some reasonably precise going on here. But you know, it's a, a it's an operation that's quite dangerous and might might damage the 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 program or the the, the person subject to it. So it could be done in a in a sort of crude, let's see what happens kind of way, or it could be done in a much more precision way. It could be using you know, established techniques. It could be using tools and so on. Um, and perhaps one of the examples that that it's worth talking about the, the, the things that begin that begin to interest me in in doing refactoring is perhaps this example. You're writing, and I, I'm not going to apologise. I know it's a Haskell meetup, but I'm going to show you examples that involve Erlang and Haskell and OCaml. Um, so I hope that's okay. I mean, just, just to be fair, just to be fair, it's not a Haskell meetup. It oh, is definitely. Yeah, yeah, there is there is a Berlin Haskell group, but this is for all functional languages concepts. You are completely on oh, point here. Okay, all right, thank you. Oh, that makes me even that makes me. I don't need to apologize. I can celebrate the diversity. Right. So, for example, you've written this loop, and you decide actually, I want to reuse. I want to reuse some of this. So you you identify the part that you want to reuse. Um, oh, and you discover that it's, um, it's, it's these three lines you want to reuse. And you think, okay, I want to extract those into a function. So you, you can, you, if you're doing this by hand, you can cut and paste and, and what will happen is you'll produce, you'll produce something like this. You, you'll produce a new function um, and you'll call that function at um, the place where, it, it, um, where you extracted it from. But it's worth realizing here that there is stuff going on that is, is, um, isn't simply cut and paste. What you have to understand here is that parts of the code, if we just move back, um, parts of the code are, um, oops, sorry, I'm having problems with my, I think there's an attention thing going on. Right, so parts of the, the code we're extracting has some free variables. And what we have to do is those three variables have to become the arguments, the, the formal parameters of this function that we're extracting. And that's something that we have to worry about. Um, so we, we move beyond cut and paste because what we're doing is something that makes semantic sense for the language. Um, if we were just to say body with no parameters, what we would have would, um, would not be sensible. But we have to have formal parameters in the function and we have to pass in actual values, which happen to be the same the same variables when we call the function. So you can begin to see that, that though it looks like we're just taking three lines out of the, the text, what we're doing is having to think, be aware of the fact that this is not just text we're dealing with, but it's, it's language that has meaning. And that's where my interest as a, as a programmer and a researcher comes in. So, you know, I said this was my, this was my summary of topics I wanted to talk about, and I think what I want to do is, is say quite up front, I want to focus on things that are, are more, rather more global. I'm not so interested in linting. I mean, linting is great and there's some really nice tools like HLint and tools for Erlang and so on. But those tools just focus on single, single occurrences. It's taking an expression and rewriting an expression. I'm more interested in things that focus on something global. So a particularly quintessential example of this is renaming. You, know, you have an identifier that um, names a piece of significant piece of, of code, a function, a data type, a constructor, or whatever. And that typically can be used across a code base. And when you rename, that renaming has impact across that code base. And it's therefore something that is, there are incentives for not doing it. You might mess, mess your code up if you do that. It's complicated to edit a whole lot of files. It's the sort of thing that begs for, um, it's not interesting, but it's, diff it's complex, it's difficult. Um, so providing support for that makes a lot of sense. You might re rename a single identifier, or you might, an example I came across in, in the Erlang world, there are different the typical way of, of naming identifiers in Erlang is to use underscores between words. So instead of saying camel case with a capital C, as you see there, you say camel underscore case. And somebody said, well, can you refactor this project so we get rid of all camel case and turn it into Erlang 
compliant um, identifiers. So doing that wholesale refactoring is the sort of renaming is the sort of thing a tool can do well. Um, similarly, you might change the, the representation of a type, you might add, add fields to a type and so on. You might change the API of something. And that's a very general sort of refactoring that gets done one of the most um, one of the most common refactorings, I think. Um, and we're forced to do that um, because people make um, non-backwards compatible changes. And again, an Erlang example, the, the regular expression library for Erlang changed a few years ago. And it changed all the all the library functions with it. Somebody had written a new one and they decided to make that the standard. And the way the, the base point for indexing into lists changed from zero to one, for example. So all sorts of things, breaking changes came in. But so I think what, I'm, what I want to focus on here are things which are not, are not entirely local. So that's, that's the, the first thing I'd like to say. And then we've got this question about, do we want to do things by hand? And of course, doing, doing local things by hand makes a lot of sense, but doing glo more, more global things by hand, it's tedious, it's error prone and interesting an observation that I had from um, talking to Jane Street, who um, whose code, because they're a financial institution, is subject you know, is subject to rather more code review than than in other situations. They made the they they made the observation that refactoring pull requests are the worst to review because it's hard to engage. They really are fiddly. You're thinking if you're renaming things, you've got to check that you've caught all the instances you should quite catch. You've not captured anything you shouldn't. It's quite difficult to do that by hand. So you know, again, this is, this is an example of not just the refactoring itself is difficult, but reviewing it for compliance reasons is, um, is tedious as well. So I think having a tool that allows you to um, allows you to get a bit more, uh, perhaps do less uh, review because you're, you can trust the tool is going to be a benefit to, 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 that, to people who are worried about code compliance. But of course it then pushes the question on to what, what are the reasons you have for trusting the tool? Um, and I think the other point I'd make here about wanting to have tool support is that you can, you can do things in a much more speculative way. You can try something out if you don't like it, then just revert. Um, tools can support undo, or you can simply, if you're using um, Git or whatever, you revert to the the um, the point before you made the refactoring. So I think tools can enhance your creativity. You can try things out in a way that, it, if it's going to take you an hour's or a day's work, um, you're unlikely to try it. But um, if it if it's done at the push of a button, you will. So I think. There's a focus in this on, on, on tool support. Um, but I will come back to um, the, the, when we talk about why, why should we use your tool, I'll come back to that and, and talk about it. Um, now, I think I'm going to come off the fence about uh, automated refactoring. Choosing which refactorings to make makes no sense unless you have a human in the loop. You try to automate which refactorings to perform it just doesn't make any sense. And I'm going to give you a case study of that from some work we did with Ericsson. And then I want to talk about the pragmatics, the pragmatics, why should I use your tool and the question of trust? Um, because it's not, it's not clear. Different people come from very different positions on this and I'll talk about that. And then finally, I want to, for a long time, I, and I've got a slide, from a couple of years ago saying, abandon any idea of building language independent refactoring tools. I think I changed my mind on this. So, and I want to explain why and how that's happened. So, and I'll conclude with that. So I hope that that's given you a prospect. I'll talk a bit about tool building. I'll talk examples. I'll talk about pragmatics. I'll talk about how we try and guarantee trust in what we're doing. Okay. So, let me, a very brief overview of what we've done. We built tools for Haskell, Erlang, and, and OCaml. And I should say there is a, the we here, I've had a number of collaborators and contributors. I, there's a full list on the final slide. Um, so I do want to, none of this work would have been done without 
a, a fantastic group of collaborators. Um, so, so what we have here is a very brief overview of, whoops, uh, of, of our three tools. And there's quite a bit to say here, which, and I won't take up all the points. Um, Hair was the first, the first tool we wanted, you know, our, our first love was, was to get, do refactoring for Haskell. And what we did was build a tool for Haskell 98. It was based on a, um, a very nice piece of work. I mean, this was begun quite a while ago now. So it was based on some stuff from about 20 years ago, a system called Programmatica, which um, was a, a, an alternative framework for, uh, for Haskell. At the time that we built Hair, we were not confident that we could use GHC's internals. GHC was, you know, too many lives had been lost, people going into, going into the bowels of GHC and never emerging. Um, we didn't feel we could use that. So we used this Haskell 98 um, framework. And we put a lot of work into done basic refactoring, some clones and some detection and type-based um, and we built it on top of the Strafunsky, which is a strategic programming framework. Unfortunately, the, the killer in that, for that project was um, the 98 there. The fact that it worked for Haskell 98 meant that people said, oh, it's great, I'd really like to use it, but my project uses this extension, this extension, this extension. And it's only through, only in the last few years where Alan Zimmerman has taken the, the project over and has, has mapped hair onto the GHC API that were able to use it um, on GHC Haskell and not, not the, the um, Haskell 98 standard. So one of the questions, why should I use your, why should I use your tool? One answer to why shouldn't I use your tool is that it doesn't cover the whole language. So trying to cover the whole language was something we wanted to do for Erlang. Erlang is a more compact language and we did achieve that. Um, and the experience of, of refactoring Erlang is quite different. It's weakly typed, it's an impure, you know, it has side effects and so on. It uses, it has a, a macro language that's used heavily. Um, and I, I hate to say this, one of the things that made it easier was the fact that Erlang was weakly typed. So we had to use a strategic programming, a, a generic programming environment to make hair work because we had to type our transformations in Erlang, we could just write functions that would work on any type of syntax. And so naive strategic programming let us work in there. And we were able to, to replicate work we'd done for Haskell, but also put in quite a lot more for, um, for Erlang. We had module level refactorings and we're doing repartition of, of, of functions within modules, moving um, bindings between modules and so on. But also we built um, a DSL for structuring complex refactorings from, um, from simple ones and so on. And then recently what we've done is look at OCaml. So we've looked at which, and the, the key feature I think of OCaml is it's complex module structure. Um, and that's led us, and this is what I'm going to talk about now. It's led us to think about um, the theory of OCaml in a different way. And so it perhaps brings, brings up the point I made earlier on about um, when we looked at the function extraction. You know, you you, as soon as you start thinking about refactoring, you have to think about what the language means. And that involves syntax and static semantics and dynamic semantics and module structure and so on and so forth. All those things get pulled into thinking about refactoring. Um, it's also interesting, the framework we use there is we use, um, I hate to say this, we use a visitor, we derive a visitor pattern to perform refactorings. Um, and because that's the generic programming paradigm that's supported in OCaml. And I think if you're building tools, you need to go with the grain of, um, of what the language ecosystem supports. So there's a lot of strategic programming, generic programming frameworks for Haskell, we use one of those, whereas in, in OCaml, the, the gen generics have been focused on the, um, on the uh, visitor paradigm. So there are the, there are the um, tools, and here, is the, um, here are the three URLs for hitting those. Um, 
hitting those. I'll put these up in the um, I'll put these in the chat, but also I'll be happy to share a copy of the slides. Um, I can put those. I'll stick those up on my web page and, and share that. Um, so we have those three. But let's talk a bit about Rotor and let's talk about OCaml. Um, and let's look at some code. Um, so OCaml has signatures. So here we see a signature, um, which is a, a, we call it stringable. It's a, a signature that says you can go from type T to um, a string. And here we've got a, um, an example where we can take two stringable things, X is stringable, Y is stringable, and we produce a, um, a pair of stringable things, and they are themselves stringable. And let's have a look now. Here we've got a, a, an example. This is a, this is a signature, here's a structure. Um, it's an int structure, it's got a T, and it's got a two string method. Oh, we got, happen to have a, um, a string structure that's got a two string method. And um, finally, note that we've not given the, either of these structures a type. We've not said what type these things are. But what we do here is we're saying, actually, I want to build a module P, which takes a string and in, an in int and pairs them and then pairs the result with an int. Now let's look at what happens when you do a traditional binding analysis on this. Here is, this is the place where two string has its binding occurrence. This is the place where two string is, is defined. Because these things, because X and Y are stringable, the use of two string there and there binds to this. And also here, the two string occurrence in the result here binds to the definition of two string there. So these two, bind to the two string there. This two string binds to that one. And these two strings simply sit on their own. But they are not independent. And they're not independent because we passed string and int as arguments to pair here. And because we passed int and string as arguments here, they get the type stringable. So all of a sudden, we have built an association of this two string to this one, and this two string to this one. So all of a sudden, two things that were independent have become dependent simply because somewhere else in the program, we passed an argument into a functor here. And in a similar way, the whole thing is a um, is a um, so the the result of the pair there is passed in as a stringable. So we'll have this association of two string to that as stringable in the signature. Now this may seem like a a contrived example, but this is the way that identifiers in OCaml get associated together. And the, the yellow lines you're seeing here are the standard binding that you get in a um, in, the, in the syntax. Whereas these, these purple lines are ones which are generated as it were dynamically, independently of the binding structure. These are generated by the fact that we have created this module level application. And because of that, we associate those. Um, so what we built in our, um, in this paper, which we had in a, in a conference last year, was, was he had this notion of a theory of a naming dependency. So I think what I wanted to, I think that I wanted to give this as sort of evidence of why, um, of how refactoring takes you right into the heart of the language. 
in order to understand what is going on when you want to rename and just to to remind you because of these pink associations if i rename this to if i say i want to rename this to string here i will automatically have to rename the this one and this one but because of the associations i've given i'll have to rename all the other ones that are joined by um by these pink and then by these yellow bindings so you can see that the association of, in the end, all the two strings in this example have to be renamed. And this was the, this was the theory that we, we put together there. So one thing is, you know, you're getting to the heart of this, um, the heart of the language by implementing, by understanding what's going on in, um, when you're doing naming. Okay, and that's one, that's one example. Zooming out a bit, um, it's worth making the general point that refactorings are not just transformations. So refactorings are transformations, but they're transformations which have complex preconditions. And those preconditions can involve anything from this menu here. The static semantics, we have to make sure we're renaming everything we should and nothing we shouldn't. Types, I'll show you an example in a second. They can involve in Erlang understanding the role of atoms. It can involve understanding what a macro does, what, a, what the C preprocessor does. They can involve questions of side effects. If a, if a piece of code can have a side effect and you try and extract that into a, um, a function, how do you handle that? And it, it going on and on. So typically, transformations are relatively straightforward once you have established the right preconditions and that's often where the, the difficulty lies. Just to show you an example, um, here we've got a function f of x which takes is the answer is x squared plus 42 plus x plus 42. It's trivial to replace the 42s by a variable and form a function fxy. So we've generalized that f to um, to have from one parameter to having two, fine. Here's a definition of a, um, a funny, it's an integer in fact, we, it's the length of this list joined to the empty list plus the length of this list joined to the empty list. So the, uh, the um, this is going to be, well, it's, the, the, it's going to be the number two. We can build a function out of that by replacing all the empty lists by a variable, x's. Unfortunately, that doesn't type check because this instance of empty list is a list of lists. This empty instance of empty list is a list. And so they are, though they are the same thing, they occur at different types and you can't force which forces this parameter to be polymorphic, which isn't supported by Haskell's type system. So just replacing identical textually objects is not, um, is not a safe operation in terms of the Haskell type system. So it's not just a matter of syntax, it's a matter of understanding the types of the, of the things you're looking at. And here's a, um, a classic Erlang example We've got here a module called foo, which imports, uh, exports two functions. One is foo with one argument, this function, and the second is foo with zero arguments. Um, and what the zero argument foo does is it spawns in the module foo, the function foo, which has one argument, and here we've given it the atom foo. If I rename this atom foo, do I have to rename the others? No, this atom denotes a module, this denotes a function, this denotes an atom. So if I rename the function foo1, this will be renamed, this will be renamed. If I rename the module, this will be renamed. Um, so we have to understand, looking at an atom, how it's used. So, and this is, you know, this is one of the reasons why it's difficult to think of refactoring as being language independent. If you look at the previous example, we were worrying about types and 
um, generalization. In this example, we're worrying about how atoms, which are, don't exist in Haskell in the same way, how atoms are, are, are handled. So there's a lot going on. Refactoring is emphatically not about um, textual transformations. It's about semantically aware transformations. And there's a question, there's a whole lot of questions there about how best to support those. And what we've, you know, the approach we've taken, as you saw in the slide when I talked about the tools, is using the existing language frameworks whenever we can. Use the front end of a compiler. That's the place where you can get type information, binding information, and so on. Okay, so we built tools, we built tools using, using infrastructure that, that is there. Let me tell you a tiny bit about um, why I think automation, why I think automating the application of refactorings is, is doomed to failure. And let me just show you a, a little story about clone detection. Um, so one of the things we looked at when you looking at, when you when you talk about clones, what you mean is you want to uh, eliminate code that is identical or perhaps even similar. Um, so one of the things that we did in identifying clones was was come up with this notion of what a cloned expression looked like. And so a cloned expression here, if you look at these from far enough away, what you see on both the left-hand side and right-hand side is an addition. So you can see both of those as examples of addition. So there's a, a pink thing added to a green thing. And so you can abstract that into pink variable plus um, green variable. And you can make that into a function. And then you can replace the two instances by two applications of, um, of the function. Oops, sorry, no, I'm sorry, my, my animation has gone wrong there. What, what that should do finally, this is what happens when you mess with your slides too much. It should say f of x plus three and four on the left and f of four and, and, and this expression on the right. So we're able to replace both those expressions by calls to this function and the function embodies the clone. So, and we're able to look for that. We built a tool for Erlang that does that um, and does it pretty, pretty efficiently. It uses a string matching algorithm to, um, to locate clones as sequences of expression. So if we're, if we're um, detecting clones and wanting to remove them, what's the, what do we have to do? Well, we have to identify clones um, and then we have to name the new function, the function f, and we have to name the new variables introduced. So you know, what, could be, what could go wrong with that? What could be the problem? Well, you first of all got to decide what a clone is. Um, now, you probably don't want it to be too small. So what we did was invent some thresholds. So we'd say, as you saw earlier on, Erlang programs are sequences of expressions. We'd say to be an interesting clone, like the body of a new function, it should have at least five, should it have five steps within it. And it should probably involve at least 20 tokens. So it's not, it's not tiny. But on the other hand, each time you do a proper generalization, you introduce a new variable. So maybe you want to control how many variables. You don't want too many places where the things differ. So we choose, we say we don't want to have more than, than four new variables. And finally, we want to say, well, actually, we want the, it to look reasonably close. So in terms of the size of the abstraction, the generalization versus the size of the concrete things, we don't want that to be, we want that to be at least 0.8. Because of course, any, any two expressions can be abstracted into a single variable. Um, f of x equals x, that has two instances, this expression and this expression. But, you know, you've got to be aware of this. Look, we've got here, these four figures are chosen arbitrarily. It could be six here, it could be 16. This could be two. And the, the, the results we'll see will depend crucially on the values we choose here. Now, maybe we could use machine learning or something to, to help us 
Um, but there are more problems. Um, if you take a look at what our, um, what our code can produce, um, what you see here are two fragments of our line code. And the first one, um, it produces a new function and it, one of the variables that goes in is filter name and the second is a new variable. It spots a, a place where there's a divergence. But look at where that new variable sits. It sits, it's the last thing in the, in the body of the function. And then what we have to return are things that are used afterwards, which are um, these rule sets, which are set in here. And also this thing filter key is defined in here. So we have to, we have to return that. So our clone function has done this. Now, in fact, if you look at the spirit of what's going on here, this line doesn't belong in the clone and this time line doesn't, but they just accidentally happen to be called before and after this piece of, of functionality. So in a sense, the right function to extract was this one, though the heuristics got us to identify the one above. And so, um, and this was just in, a, in looking at an example of, of, of test code from Ericsson. So we, we felt you know, in practice, you can't, this would be identified as a clone, you put instance of it in there, but you can't describe what this, what this function does. So it's been found by some, some automated method. You can't easily choose what you, how you'd name it. I mean, here at least we've got, we've extracted the names of the two, um, of the two parameters that we need, that was done automatically, as were the, the, was the result set. But um, we still have to name the function. So the conclusion we came to was, you can only do this sort of clone elimination by bringing in the experts. You need to name functions and arguments, and you need to decide which parts of the, um, which clones are accidental and which are, are meaningful. Um, and you, in some situations, you, you want to explore changing some of the threshold parameters. So I think our experience, our, our takeaway from that was, if you want to do this kind of clone elimination, then you really have to do it with an expert guiding all these things, guiding the naming so that the clone elimination, the clones are meaningful, they're, they're well-named, the arguments are well-named and so on. And I think the same is true if you, if you look at renamings, if you look at extracting functions, if you look at remodularization, any of the things that you can in principle do by, um, with automation, in practice, it, it's very difficult to do. Um, so I think I'm very skeptical about any, anyone who says, we can automatically improve your code. Don't trust them, they're selling snake oil. Um, oh, and this is this is the paper where we, we talked about that. In, it, it's a much longer um, exposition of that particular case study. Okay, now let's get on to the let's get on to the, the question of why should I use your system? Um, there are a number of concrete benefits. Um, if I'd used your system, it might get me 95% of the way, and that's better than 0%. In other words, it might break your code, but if it's only broken 5% of it, I can fix that faster than doing the refactoring by hand, for example. And some things I think are almost infeasible without some sort of tool support. If you want to rename a whole number of identifiers across a large project. It's going to be difficult to do that without some sort of renaming support. Um, and this was, we saw this in our discussions with Jane Street, using a tool can, can be used in support of approving a pull request, simply because the fact the tool has done it and the tool has, has established some trust allows you to ap approve that pull request. And we did another case study with another company, Qvic, where we were able to, um, using some extensibility, um, 
facilities in, in Wrangler to automate a repetitive task that the cubic testers had to had repeatedly to do. And that, that was saving substantial amounts of time. So saving time, doing things that are infeasible without, those can be concrete benefits. Um, it's also interesting, instructive to look at, um, to look at how people use a tool that you provide. Um, and if you look here, we can see that renaming functions, renaming variables, moving functions between modules, those are the three most used refactorings. After that comes function extraction, the example I showed you earlier on. Um, and we have some refactorings where we thought, why did we, why did we introduce this? We had refactorings to introduce a new macro from, um, it just got used once um, in, this, in this particular test, test set that we're looking at. So I think one of the things that, that refactoring tool, this, this led us to, to realize is doing the simple things well was the best approach to building the tool. Do renaming so it works properly and it's comprehensive and that will support uh, the majority of your, um, of your use cases. And then simply moving function between modules and so on. Uh, if you do that in function extraction, that gets you close to having um, uh, three quarters of the, of the use is covered. So a small number of, of operations done well will, will be useful in practice. What are the reasons people give for not using a tool? Um, well, my favorite editor isn't supported. That's, I think, going away now with, with um, the language server protocol. I think with editors standardizing on LSP, I think it makes it a lot easier for tool builders to, um, to use, uh, to think, okay, I'll support LSP and it can be incorporated in, um, in whatever editor you like. Another reason is it doesn't build, integrate with your build or test tool. That can be a problem. If what happens is you, you break the conventions of your test tool or you, you break your build script, that's a problem. You're not supporting a language extension, but the most difficult, the one that, that is, is causes the most grief to people who want to build refactoring tools is this. Layout. Oh. For example, how do you lay out your lists? Do you put the commas after the elements or do you put the commas before? How do you lay out tuples? Do you have spaces between items or not? In Haskell, do you use parentheses or do you um, use dollar for infix application? Um, and how do, you, how do you lay out your type declarations, type definitions? If what you do is take a layout, take the gray layout and turn it into the black layout, your users will not be happy. They want their programs to look as if they had written them. And this has been, typically compilers don't support, um, typically compilers don't hang on to all the white space information. Um, they hang on to some, but not perhaps all of it. So it can be, getting these things to, to lay out code as, as if it had been laid out, you know, preserving layout and synthesizing layout that looks, looks plausible in the case you're generating new code is such a nightmare. And it's interesting to, to, to see this observation from Twitter. Um, just flip to big code, code base to doing automatic formatting. There are some regressions in readability, but there's something freeing about it. Nothing like not needing to make choices. You know, it is not having, being able to lay your code out in your own sweet way is really not, is not a help. And there's an interesting observation from Don Stewart in response to that, that code review can be faster when format is removed from the equation. And this is certainly, you know, the benefits are huge for tool developers. We don't need to build support for data thrown away by compilers. We don't have to make up formatting for code that's been synthesized. So we're moving to, to programming languages that aren't 
represented in text would be such a great thing. You know, text is, is not, text is not how we want to see our programs. Um, but people have been talking about this for 30 years, moving beyond programs as text, and nobody has got the right answer. So it's easy to say text is wrong. It's hard to see quite what the, what the right answer is going to be. Simon, may I ask a question? Yeah, do, definitely. Do you feel that this is a decision that should be taken away from the developer? I know people often have a lot of strong opinions about uh, code formatting, code style, um, that you can solve this in teams by agreeing to a common standard or in companies by agreeing to a house style. Yes. Al alternatively, you could do this at the language level. I, I think Go, for example, mm -hmm enforces this so you you literally can't even argue about it you just apply the formatter and it makes it does it for you whether you like it or not yeah because i think that yeah, yeah i would definitely go for that because i think you know it, as, as ron says there are some regressions in readability but you will learn you will learn to read that um i yeah i think that would be you know if i if i could make haskell change in one way i'd say this is the format now, of course, it's not going to happen now, but I think if I were building a new language, that's definitely what I would do. Definitely. I, I find Haskell's spacing rules to be super annoying because sometimes they matter and often they don't. And you exactly. just kind of have to remember and get it right. And you can you can change the meaning of a program by changing the layout. So that's a problem. You know, there are, yeah, there are there are there are there are difficulties. Yeah, okay, so you know, that's a challenge. If you're, if you're a language designer, just don't let people lay things out. Just, just give them a formatter and that. And, and then what's nice is that the, you no longer, the text is simply a representation of the abstract syntax tree. Um, and then you can do whatever you want with the AST and think you can then build sort of semantically aware, um, uh, you know, semantically aware version of, of GitHub. So you check in changes that are not text, you know, you don't check, check in textual differences, you check in meaningful uh, differences in terms of the, the, um, the underlining meaning of the program, in terms of the, the syntax tree, say. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it, once you accept that, it, it flips things on their head. And I, yeah, I would definitely go for that. Now there are, there are people who say, well, why are we bothering with refactoring anyway? You know, if it tight checks, then it's fine. If it runs, then it's fine. I don't need a tool. I mean, the tight checking does help. It certainly does. And, and that, you know, it will get you a long way. But um, tight checking is for renaming. I'm not sure it helps so well. Um, and certainly regression testing, it's, it's clear that regression testing on, on you know, a set of test cases is not doesn't guarantee um, doesn't guarantee semantics preservation, and I think I'll go you know in a second I'll I'll talk a bit more about what I see as 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 useful here. Um, and, and there are you know this is I've I've taken a few things from uh, off the web here. You, what, this is a, a from FP Complete, a software project mentioned. This is where Haskell shines. It talks about how good Haskell is for for um, for refactoring, and you know there's there's a discussion here by Alan Zimmerman about wanting to make changes to what the GHC abstract syntax tree looked like, um, and saying you know he he did changing the data type and then fixing compilation errors. Yeah, it was really helpful. And you know, clearly it is, and, and having a, a strongly typed system is, is going to be better than a weakly typed system. Um, but I think the, the jury is out about you know, whether Haskell is, is the language which makes refactoring and development easy. So there, you know, there, I, I've anonymized these for, to protect the, the, um, the authors. You know, Haskell is very easy and safe to refactor. Even if I have a very bad code base, you could fairly mechanically and safely transform it until you have better code. Yeah, maybe. Um, you know, there are code bases for which this isn't easy or safe. So I think, you know, it, it's, and I think one of the, the, the problems with, um, with functional programming in general is that often there are very smart people can, can overcomplicate things 
there are people who are over um, over ambitious about what they want to do, overconfident about what they know and what they don't. Keeping things simple um, is 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 something that I would really I would really strive for here. So you know, I think not being not overselling the language. But let's move on to what I, I is kind of a central a central discussion point for what I wanted to talk about. Why would I trust your system? And let's think about, first of all, by what we mean by preserving meaning, you know, assuming that that's what that that's the heart of refactoring It's transforming code in a way that preserves the meaning of the code, something about the meaning. Now, we're not always sure what we mean. Do we mean just the, as long as the main program works or the main module, we can modify anything else under the hood. I think we probably mean more than that. We probably mean perhaps all module interfaces. And we probably mean some internals too. We, we're, we want to preserve as much as we can while doing the, the change that we've made. So, I mean, it's, but when we talk about preserving meaning, it is important to be aware of what it is and it isn't that we, we, we want to include. But there's also a question, and this is a, a rather more vexed question, that the extent of the refactoring is, is depending on your, your tool chain and so on, can be a bit broad, a bit vague. You might be using a testing framework, which has conventions on the way you name variables. And if you rename things in a way that breaks that convention, you'll break your testing framework. If you're using a build system, if you start renaming modules, you better make sure you rename things in your make files. And if you use a preprocessor or a macro system, you've really got to think hard about how you're going to um, how you're going to refactor your programs because you can certainly refactor the post-processed, um, the macro expanded code, but refactoring, pushing that refactoring back into the the code which has these preprocessors in it is again not at all straightforward. So. It works well for clean code. Um, it works well where the, 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 the borders of your project are very clearly um, delineated and probably you're, you're doing testing and building inside some, some IDE, which will ensure that um, renames and modules will, will filter into the build system and so on. <clears throat> now, you know, in, if you look in the refactoring community, there are two points of view. And I, the, the one on the left, the refactoring tools are trustworthy enough, is makes the point that I was making earlier that 95% is better than zero. Whereas the one on the right is saying, well, actually, you must earn trust. And you must earn trust by demonstrating somehow how, why, and how your tools are trustworthy. And let's take a look about what we mean by uh, what goes on in a refactoring. Um, I mean, typically what happens is we have some code from before, we transform it some way and we have the code after. And to guarantee trust, there are two things we can look at. We can look at how the two are related. We can look at the before code and the after code and say, well, how are those, you know, what, what did, what, how are the after and before related? And therefore, can we, we um, guarantee to ourselves that they have the same behavior, for example. So we can look at just the results in a purely black box way. We're not asking how the transformation has been done. We're just looking at the results. But the alternative is to say, actually, we can look at how the transformation is done and try and look at that and see that as a way of, um, of guaranteeing, getting some, some assurance that the, the tool behaves as it should. And I want to talk about the two different approaches we've taken to doing this, this sort of guarantee. So we look at how the code has changed and how the system is built. Um, so this is the, the former approach. And just to establish a bit of technology, a, a bit of terminology, I'm going to use the, the phrase an instance to say, um, when you're looking at a particular piece of code and you do a particular refactoring to it. So if I've got a project called Baz, and I change the function foo to be called bar in that project, that's called an instance of um, the general refactoring that is renaming. 
So instances of this particular um, transformation in this particular code base, whereas the refactoring in general say as well, I'm, it could be any sort of renaming in, in any um, Haskell project, for example. So if we look at, at how code has changed, there are three things we can look at really. Um, we can look at unit tests, we can look at random testing, and we can look at, at equivalence checking. And let's say, let's look at that first. So unit tests, we say, does, does the after code pass all the unit tests that, that the before code passed? And that is pretty much the state of the art of assurance for most refactoring tools. You say, I mean, people accept that it works if the refactoring has gone through this particular instance, remember, has gone through if the instance after meets all the tests that the instance before met. Um, but that's assuming your unit tests embody the functionality of your, your program. You can go a bit further. You can say, actually, and you can do this without, um, without having unit tests at all. You can say, well, can we check? Are the before and the after, do the before and after programs behave in the same way if you give them random inputs, which you can generate? Um, and we use that, um, we've used that as a way of testing. And that can be very effective. Um, you can, you know, generating random inputs for functional programs will, will expose potentially places where those two functions behave differently. So what you can see this is that we're going to build up a matrix here, but this gives us, this is the, reassurance you, your assurance you get for particular instances by testing the results of those instances. Um, but we could try and test, if we've got a refactoring, we could try and test many instances. Um, and we have done this by randomly generating programs and then randomly refactoring them. So we can do that. And so that tests that tests renaming, for example, we generate random programs and then we, um, we check that the behavior, the programs produced um, are, um, are the same as the programs that were there before. Or we can take another refactoring tool and there is, you know, Wrangler is one refactoring tool for Erlang, Refactor Earl is another, and we can test them, play them against each other using each as the oracle for the other. And that's a great way of finding errors in both the tools. There's some very nice work of Danny Digg and his colleagues um, who did work similarly on the Java refactorers in, um, in the, 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 Sun, the Sun Java refactorer and the, um, the IBM in the, in the two IDEs and found a number of errors in both of them by doing that. So you can test the refactorings themselves. So by generating generating random programs or, or choosing programs at random for a, lower, a large corpus. But testing will always be complete. It gives us assurance, it's effective, but it isn't, it isn't guaranteeing in the same way that um, verification will be. So what we can think of instead is if we have a formal semantics, if we've got some way of formalizing what programs mean, we can compare meanings directly and automatically. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, and again, this is something in, in the functional programming world we've been talking about for a long time, but you know, routinely still, we can't say, here's some Haskell, tell me what the, you know, describe exactly what this, form, the semantics of this program is. Um, ditto for, for Erlang and OCaml. Standard ML, there was an attempt, but that, I think that it's fair to say that that suffered from bit rot, so is no longer, a, a, an acceptable semantic. So it's a shame, you know, we talked about how, how accessible functional programs are to semantics, but never quite got there. Um, so one thing that we've looked at is, is we've um, looked at using SMT solving to check uh, where you have two functions to check um, that the before and the after forms are the same. Now, you know, that's, it's a finite method, but it will allow us to produce, um, produce evidence, for example, that, that, um, that two things are different. So it's a good way of spotting differences because you're, you're, an SMT solver will give you counterexamples. 
Alternatively, you can um, try to build, you know, you know the, the structure of the, um, the programs before and after, you could try to build a proof in your, um, in your system that the before and after programs are equal using what people call proof planning. Um, so that gives you a, me a mechanism for um, potentially for doing this work. Now we haven't, this is not something that we've done. We've done some small experiments, but I can't say that we've got the technology here to, to roll out. Um, but one place where we have looked oops, is, um, is looking at, at um, trying to build proofs of the refactoring tools themselves. So looking inside the tool to see how it is that the refactorings are performed, this is the place where potentially we can do the strongest sorts of um, verification. And also where we can provide assurance of, of a different kind. So let's take a look at, like, let's take a look at that. We're looking at how the system is built. So if we wanted to prove a refactoring works, we need to look inside the black box, but it's worth looking inside the black box anyway, to see what's in there. Um, now our first attempt, which I, we did, I did with, with Nick Sultana a number of years ago, what we did was um, we proved for a very small uh, model of what uh, a refactoring was, we managed to prove renaming in a, a name capturing Lambda calculus. So, and what, what we proved with a theorem like this for every program P, if P meets the precondition Q, then the transformed version of P is the same, has the same behavior as, as the original program. So that's the general shape of the, the sorts of things we want to prove. And we did make some progress, but I have to say the progress was, was a first step in a, in a, in a very long chain. And I'll talk a bit about um, other things we might do further down the line. But as well as looking at verification, I think it's, it's interesting to look at, um, at architecture, because I think, let's see what, what a, a typical refactoring tool does. Um, I mean, it starts off with a program, it parses it, it analyzes it, and that's the thing with the, you've got the tree with the bits on it, and then it transforms it in some way and renders it back as a, as a as a program, as a text. Now the the external bits are not interesting. I mean they're they're parsing and you no. Know, we assume we can we can write a parser and a pretty printer that work. That's not a that's not the focus here. But if you're writing a refactoring tool, what effectively you are doing is you're writing a program that takes big trees which contain all sorts of information and your trans you're adding extra information to those things and then transforming them in some way. So your program in the end is a big tree manipulating program. Now, we could look at those, but I think there are, there are good arguments here that say having the right architectural approach here can make increase the trustworthiness of the system you're building. So we need to think about how we can architect systems so that perhaps we can um, we can make sure they're layered in an appropriate way so that we can exploit generality. We're not writing different traversals for different refactorings if we can avoid it. We provide the right level of abstraction um, so that we can architect systems that have a, at least a degree of language independence. And let's look at, 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 at what I mean by this. Um, you can think of high level schemes or patterns they're like they're like programming patterns that reflect what goes on in a lot of refactorings so at a high level what a function definition looks like is that f applied to a pattern gives the result and you have a number of applications so in every language certainly every functional language you have these two you have definitions of functions and you have function applications. So we can think of that as a scheme. And in fact, if we think of transforming definitions and applications, that allows us to 
in ca to capture a whole lot of different refactorings. We can, by doing a, a traversal like that, we can do renaming, we can deal with reordering arguments, regrouping arguments, generalizing, adding an argument, or indeed removing an argument. All of those refactorings require us to traverse the definition and the, all the applications of that function. And so, for example, you know, if, we're, if what we're doing is, is renaming, you're turning F to G. If what we're doing is swapping arguments, we're, um, we're behaving in this way. And, you could, so, and it involves visiting those same pieces of the code. If what we're doing is generalizing here, you see that um, we've got a function F, which is X plus three, and we have an application to A. If we, if we replace three by Y, we then have to add three as an extra argument in every application. So we're, as with all of these, what we're doing is transforming the definition in one way and the, um, all the applications. And so if we can build a traversal, a way of, of running through code that looks at function applications and function definitions, then that will allow us to build all these refactorings on top of the same traversal code. So that sort of architecting of the system gives us, um, should give a user a substantially more um, assurance that the system is going to behave as it should than if, um, than if we each refactoring gets, um, is defined separately. Now, of course, there are, um, there are there can be problems um, now when I say abstractly what the the language provides is definition and application that's true but when you look at any particular language application can mean a number of different things here we have we can turn identifiers into infix by putting them in back quotes we can partially apply functions we can partially apply operators. So here we've turned F into an operator and here we partially apply it. But, and this is the nice thing about layering, this as a language independent level can turn into the, the application part, turns into all of these things in the, um, in the implementation for Haskell. The Haskell implementation has to be aware of these, these different ways of, of describing application, um, partial applications and, and um, infix. But the transformation, the abstract transformation, is still this simple high-level one. And of course, if you look at Erlang, there, if we're looking at the function f here, f gets referred to symbolically in this position. Um, so the atom is used to denote that function f there. And here we have. Um, passing a function g, we have to say fun g. So this use of, of this application of the function here has to turn into these specific bits of, of, of code for Erlang. But we can, we can still describe the top level renaming in terms of this, this high level pattern and then map it onto this particular instantiation for Erlang. Um, and in fact, for OCaml, we can realize this in a very nice way. We can, we can say that the, when, when the function call pattern, we can describe what we have to do by substituting a Lambda term and rewriting. And let me just show you that. So suppose we want to swap the arguments of G. We can describe that by this Lambda expression. And what we do is we, we replace G by that Lambda expression and then we rewrite. And if you apply that under expression, A becomes three, B becomes four. So the application G34 becomes the application G43. So taking the G, substituting the lambda expression and simplifying gives us this. And it also works for partial application. If we apply G to three and we swap arguments, we swap arguments, we take here's we replace G by this lambda, and we can apply the A here, and then we get the result is fun 
the function that takes b to g of b and 3. And we have to do this because you can't partially apply a function to its second argument. We have to apply, uh, we have to do that there. And in a similar way, if we apply it to g, we just get, it just gets replaced by this function. But it means that we can do, perform this swap argument simply by replace, uh, let's go back to an example, this, the original example, take the original, take the application, replace the G there by this lambda expression and reduce, reduce the beta. And that gives us, that gives us the swap arguments pattern, it gives us generalization and so on. And that's all implemented on top of this simple substitute, a lambda term, which gets rewritten. So that gives us a way of architecting. This is something that we've done in our rotor tool. It gives us a way of architecting a whole lot of um, refactorings on top of those simple substitution and, and rewrite. And so we've got visitors that will, a, a, a visitor defined pattern that will do that um, and into that we can plug renaming, swapping arguments, generalization, and so on. I'll, I'll skip over that. So we can architect systems so that they are, um, so that they are, their architecture gives people assurance that they're built in as, um, as uh, principled and as, as, as lean a way. But what we're also doing at, at, at Roche Laurent University in, in Budapest is we're looking at saying, well, let's actually build, um, let's build language semantics and let's take these, these refactoring schemes, the examples I showed you earlier on, and actually formalize, formalize proofs that these schemes behave as they, as they should. And that again, will give us this language independence. And we have, at the moment we're working on in the COC proof assistant, we're formalizing the core Erlang language, um, and we're using, planning to use a framework for um, matching logic to, um, to formalize the transformations. So we're in the process of, of doing this formalization in COP. And so we can say to people, you, if you want the highest level of assurance, this is the way you do it. Build refactoring tools that are based on, um, that are based on proof assistance. Because you do need, you want the highest level of trust for tools that, that change what potentially change what your programs do. So that's where we're working at the moment and that will allow us to fill in this final square in the bottom right hand corner. So as I say we've done work in the other three um, and that, that will allow us to, to, to do some more work in the fourth. And we've got some publications on this um, but as I say we're structuring tools around patterns and these language independent patterns are um, are allowing us to to build tools that are um, support a degree of language independence. They're not entirely language independent. We hide the language specific stuff in a lower layer, but um, but the the um, the general pattern of function definition and call is and refactoring using those is a language independent pattern which gets mapped in instantiated different ways in different tools. Okay, um, so I think you know, what I've done, and, and thank you for, for your patience, I've probably rather overrun, but never mind, I wanted to, there was a lot I wanted to say. Um, so I've talked about what we mean by refactoring, I've talked about building tools and theory, I've talked about the illusion of automation, you know, why that it just doesn't make any sense. And I've talked about then the pragmatics of why people adopt tools and, and um, <clears throat> why people trust tools. And I talked a bit about how we might do language independent tooling. Um, again, this is the point where, oh, and there are lots of other things we could talk about, which I haven't, you know, about you know, how you build tools that are extensible, work we've done on API and we've got migration. Um, what's the ideal language for refactoring? It's one that has a fixed format um, and a number of other things. So there are plenty of other things to, to, to discuss. But what I wanted to do is get on to my, my thanks to, thanking to, thanks to my, colleagues and collaborators and, and um, funders and, and um, companies who've been, um, who've been on this journey with us. So thank you very much and I'll, I'll terminate here and happy to 
answer any questions. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, before we go to questions, and I want to give people a chance to ask some final questions, um, just a general question for you, because I'm always curious, what brought you originally to functional programming or, or to Haskell, as the case may be? Well, golly, I, it's before Haskell. So I was, um, you know, I did my PhD in, <clears throat> in, in recursion theory and math. And then just when I was finishing off, I thought, oh, like, really, there's all these exciting things going on in computing. And I read around and I just, it just seemed like such a great, great approach to, to writing programs. I mean, the, these things were, they were short and they were, you know, you could manipulate them, you could reason about them, you could write, um, and just, just so much easier to comprehend than, than what was going on in, in other languages. Um, and so I moved, I got a job at Kent and this, and Kent was where, you know, one of the key places for developing functional programs, functional programming languages. There's KRC and then Miranda, which is David Turner's, um, you know, he's, he's the best, the, the, the most well-known language he produced, which was a, a precursor of Haskell. I mean, it, in, in many ways, it shaped the whole way that Haskell was. Um, I mean, you could say in some ways Miranda is, is nicer. It's a lot smaller. You know, there were some things in Miranda that you still think, oh, it'd be nice to have that in Haskell. But I think one of the things that is, is most attractive about it is, is its size. You know, Haskell has, Haskell has everything and, and then some. It's a, it's a big, big language. Um, and Miranda, there's one way of doing things. Haskell is often two or three ways of doing the same thing. But yes, yeah, so I've been doing this for a, a number of years, and that, it was it was working with David Turner that really got me got me excited by this. So that was me. Thank you. Yeah, Haskell has become not only a, a large language, but I think some people who come to it recently as a uh, as a new and exciting part of their programming lives, like myself, they don't realize yeah. how, how old a language it is, older than yeah. older than Java, older than a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's been growing. You know, there, we were talking about <clears throat> we were talking about formatting. Now there's some some people say the language is every new feature you add, you should remove a feature. Um, I think I'm not sure anything has ever been removed. Well the only thing I know has been removed from Haskell was the N plus K patterns, um, which you could were, were there for a while. Uh, but there's an argument that it's it's it certainly makes life really difficult for tool builders. It's you know, it, and people who write textbooks and so on. Having a language that moves very quickly is, and it is. There's a lot to learn. You know, there's I wouldn't I wouldn't want to start on Haskell from nothing. And there's loads of stuff in Haskell that has passed me that you know has passed me by. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like you're interested in pragmatic solutions and it's a language that has never been super well compatible with pragmatism in a lot of ways. I mean, maybe on purpose, right? It, yeah, it's true. I mean, there was, yeah, the Simon Peyton Jones's famous thing, you know, they trying to, to avoid adoption, avoid popularity at all costs. I mean, it was, a, and I think, you know, it's been a very, very successful language and it's, 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 it's managed to, to keep that line between being a, a vehicle for research innovation, which it clearly is, and a language that can be used in practice. Um, I think I think where it's it's suffered is is in tooling. And I think, you know, I know, you know, someone like I have a huge respect for Alan Zimmerman, who's put loads of effort into I mean, into the hair project, but also into um, into Haskell language server and so on. You know, the the <clears throat> That where I think where its weakness is that is that for a newcomer, you know, getting Haskell to run on your system to give you squiggly lines and all the sort of nice feedback you'd like to have, working in Visual Studio Code or whatever, it's not that straightforward. Whereas something like JavaScript, which you know in many ways is horrid, has really nice has very nice support. Um, you, know, you can get it running very quickly. You can um, your IDE helps you, whereas you know, things like and, and the whole ecosystem is is um, is helpful, and I think that's perhaps a product of its age. You know, you look at like something like Elixir, which has been very successful. I think just because it's young, it's not got all that accumulated 
craft of all these all these different web servers that they've been produced in different build systems and so on and so forth. It's young enough that it's a convergent ecosystem. Everybody uses the same build system. They use the same web server. They um, and it means that people get up and running more quickly. They start contributing more quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think so. I think it has Haskell has been you know, being both a research and an industrial vehicle is is keeping keeping that line has been has been very successful. But I think it's the tooling has been the you know Emacs is not what you want to use. Uh, I shouldn't say this, but Emacs is not the best tool around. Oh, now I definitely have to turn comments off when I put this on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you, though. I have a, a question from Gabriella, and I have to ask because Gabriella cannot unmute. Um, you have mentioned that for some refactorings, an expert is needed. What tools or research currently exists for interactive refactoring? What tools are we OK. Um, I mean, I th there are people. I mean, well, well, in terms of tools, a lot of tools do support interactive refactoring. So, so you know, the tool we built for clone detection, that gives you a report on what clones there are. And, it's a, and then if you say, I'd like to eliminate this clone, it will say, well, these are all the instances and it will provide you automation for eliminating that clone. And we use our, our DSL for describing composite refactorings to do that. Um, so it will say, okay, you want to in, in, automate that, uh, remove that clone, tell me the name of the clone. So that when you when it gets replaced, it'll be the clone function will say, I don't know, um, system setup. So you'll have system setup in all these places. And then um, and what are the parameters to system setup? And you might say, I don't know, context and something else. So it interacts you with you in that way. And once you've set up the names and the, the names for the variables and so on, it will then run through all the cases of the clones and say, Do you want to do you want to eliminate all of them or just one or a a selection. So those sorts of tools exist. Um, people also build tools to um, to try and suggest refactoring. So that's another that's another line of research. Um, and one thing I will add to the uh, I'll put something in. Or oh, if you tell me where to put things in terms of, of text channels, I'll put a link to the slides. But also I'll put a link to. There's a very nice database of papers in refactoring so that I'll, I'll I can point you at that and you can get to see all the different um, all the different work in that sort of area and do a search on you can do a search on keywords so you should be able to find a lot more about automation there and perhaps get a different view from me on that thank you very much I'll I'll uh, have to let you know if there's a follow-up and also, if you want to email me any links or uh, articles, yeah, I will add these to the meetup and to the comments uh, or to actually the talk description uh, cool. on YouTube. I'll post them everywhere. I'll tweet them, whatever I have to do. OK, perfect. And KK has a question. And KK does have a mic. So go ahead and unmute and ask your question, please. Hey, Simon. Uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, so my question is, uh, I was wondering whether your research uh, in refactoring has been uh, useful in your, uh, in your work at IOHK. So I know you've been working uh, on uh, like a DSL project in, uh, in your work there. Yeah, I was just wondering whether it was useful there or perhaps more widely uh, in, in the company. No, that's an interesting question. So I think um, you know, one of the things that I think is, is coming in only slowly is, is um, is the, the the support for for refactoring for full Haskell, and that's getting incorporated into into the work that Alan has been Alan Zimmerman has been doing for um, for the Haskell language server and Haskell IDE project. So that's coming. I have to say, it's only coming in relatively slowly because you know Haskell is is used widely in IOHK, but often it's using parts of the language that go way beyond the work we did with Haskell ninety eight. So um, so we're perhaps doing less than we're we're doing less machines we're we're eating less of our own dog food than we should be, but that's a good question. Um, but I think I think at the moment the renaming is in there. So I think you, that's 
making sure that we have a small number of refactorings that are available to people at the touch of a button, I think is, um, that's the right route to take. Um, so that's my, yeah, that, that's my take on where things are with, um, with tooling there. And, you know, if, if you start renaming, if you start renaming uh, modules and, and so on, that can cause all sorts of problems um, with, with build setup as things stand. Yeah, but good point. Um, and I think uh, the, the example I was showing you of the, of the usage of, of, um, of Wrangler, actually the data we collected there was our own usage of Wrangler on, the, on building the tool itself. And that was, you can see that those were the, you know, we were concentrating, even though we knew what facilities we built, we were concentrating on, um, on the relatively simple aspects of it. Um, because I think, you know, it's a bit like risk versus CISC, isn't it, for processors. You could, in some sense, it's good to have that instruction, which will go blindingly fast on the, on the odd occasion that you, you use it. But in fact, the best thing to do is to, is to support the, the, um, the popular things well. And that will mean that they'll, they'll, um, you'll get usage much more than supporting, um, than supporting abstruse refactorings. Um, now, you know, one, one approach to that that we, again, we looked at in the Erlang context was to try and build a small um, API that would allow people to build their own refactorings. And that was using, trying to use Erlang, Erlang concrete syntax as a way that people could represent transformations on trees without them having to understand the internal format. And we used that with the work with Qvic for doing, um, for doing rewritings there. So yeah, we've, we've, we've had some success with that. Um, so providing people with a, a general purpose rewriting tool. And Facebook have produced a tool called Retry, R-E-T, I'll, I'll put a link to that, um, which is a, a refactoring tool for Haskell that is built on, um, which is extensible in the sense you can provide your own, your own rewritings there. Now, I'm in the process of trying to explore, it, it's perhaps more focused on smaller, small scale refactoring. So um, it will support um, you know, turning, uh, I don't know, uh, plus plus singleton into a, 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 a singleton X plus plus Y into X colon Y. So do those sort of small scale um, linting refactorings. But I think in principle, so I, I, I've got a, a student project working on, on seeing if we can code some rather larger scale refactorings into that. So there's certainly other people are, are, are looking at that as well, that idea of scripting, not giving a, a, a fixed repertoire, but having allowing people to script their own, their own transformations. Of course then, <clears throat> and this again, I'm looking at with a, a student, you've then got the question, well, what if you, you supply a rewriting that isn't, that isn't meaning preserving? So what, what we're looking at there is trying to, um, is to see whether we can hook this system up with quick check. So it will check that the, the rewritings you're suggesting are, 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 don't obviously break. Or if they do break, you're, they're not breaking in the situation you're doing the, um, doing the rewriting. So we're, we're looking at that as, as a potential extension of the retry tool. Okay, Aaron V has a question. I need to ask it myself. Are there open source projects folks could get involved in regarding the topics discussed today? I know you mentioned hair earlier. Is there anything else you could well, mention? There's, there's hair, there is rotor, there's the three projects that we're working on, we've worked with are all open source. Uh, the retry project, which is this, this Haskell project that I was I was talking about from Facebook, that is open source. Um, so you can you can I'll I'll post a link to that. Um, what else? Uh, <clears throat> I know that the 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 IntelliJ refactorers refactoring tools tend to be closed and all all written in Java, which is not so not much fun. Um, but certainly, yeah, I, all the projects I've been involved with are are open source and very you know very happy to to work with you um, if you're interested. So yeah, and and again, retry is there as a uh, another project to look at. 
So plenty of things out there to try. And there's H lint, of course. So there are these, these um, what I would call more like linters. <clears throat> and H lint is a, gets used extensively for, for doing small scale corrections to, to Haskell code, suggesting, oh, perhaps you should modify this in this way, um, you know, for efficiency or elegance reasons. Yeah, but so I'd be happy to post some links to those, yeah. So I, I, I can do that. I'll mail you all the links um, so you get those. <clears throat> yes, please. Uh, yeah. I have a somewhat naive question. I like to ask naive questions. Do you think in either um, industry or in even computer science, there is a very strong definition of what refactoring actually is? Well, I guess I was partly, I was sort of exploring that. I think different, it means different things to different people. Um, I mean, I guess it focuses on changing the, changing the how without changing the what, if you like. I mean, that's, it's, you've got a system and you want to somehow, without disturbing what it does, what it presents to the outside world, you want to restructure it somehow um, to improve it in, in some way. Um, so I think that would be, I, I think that's the, that's the colloquial definition that, that, um, that makes the most sense. And sometimes people say, so, so perhaps, you know, but then you can start unpicking that because you could say, well, do you really want to preserve everything? Do you want to preserve all the bugs? Do you want to preserve, um, you know, perhaps if you extend it, people often talk about refactoring when what they're doing is, is actually extending the system in some way. It's preserving what was there before, but adding, adding new features. So there is, um, but I suppose it's, it, it, often it's the thing, it's the thing which is desirable, but isn't essential. Um, and so for that reason, it's often the thing that doesn't get done. You know, it's and, the, and, and the thing people fight over. Yeah. It's the technical debt. You know, you've got, you, do you do this refactoring or do you add this new feature? Well, you probably add the new feature. Um, or you, you carry on adding features until you really come to a point where you can't add this next new feature because there's, so, it, there's a particular problem with the way that your, your system is structured and then you have to make that, that kind of change. You have to sneak it in with the new features. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I've often I've often thought of refactoring as extracting common functionality, but I've also heard it used in um, to describe just general code improvements. Like anything you're doing to improve the code base is a refactoring. It's and whether or not what you're doing is actually an improvement can be debatable. Sometimes repetition is preferable to abstraction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the clone. There was a, and if you look at the, the, the paper about clone elimination, I had this whole thing about premature generalization that you can, you could, yeah. So you might generalize it a little bit where in fact you should be later on, you should be you know, doing a bigger generalization, li lifting out a bigger clone, for example. So it's, yeah. And if you have this tower of functions that call each other, that's not going to be comprehensible either. So yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think, you know, I think you, it, it's clear that, that premature abstraction is one of the things that, that, that is a problem in functional programming. Just keep it concrete as long as you can. Um, because you know, designing, designing for abstraction that you don't know you need, I think is always a bad thing. It just feels so good to do premature abstraction in functional programming. It's really going with the grain of, of the style. Um, it, it's, so much more painful in other paradigms and um, in functional programming you're almost you're driven to generalize because you see the possibilities for generalization at every step yeah but that's the problem isn't it and then you you come back and you think why on earth did i write it with all these and these you know, all these type variables and you know, and, and you know what was i doing there and so it's don't you understand this function will now work for any type of input whatsoever any kind of interface yeah, yeah, and you've probably not documented it because it's no, so, no, it's self-documenting. Self-documenting, yeah, 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 yep. <laughs> Enough said. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting to me that you mentioned the human element uh, for this reason. I mean, you have to make a decision at a certain point. 
what kind of refactoring is necessary. I, I'm constantly getting little tool tips now in VS Code inviting me to extract functions out of, I mean, I, I generally speaking do this when I feel it's necessary, but now I get a little light bulb icon in VS Code that will suggest to me, you should extract this into a separate function, even if I've only, I'm only using it in one place. I don't necessarily want to do that, but the, the IDE is encouraging me to. That's interesting. Yeah, this may only be for JavaScript code bases though, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a JavaScript where they're, yeah, I've been, we've been using the Java in a, in a different project, I've been using it. It is very well developed, the, the JavaScript IDE support, but it's, um, yeah, I'm not sure I'd, uh, yeah, and that, those sorts of, you know, sometimes those things are really helpful, but yeah, but that does sound like, that sounds like premature abstraction to me. Yeah, yeah it's, it's clippy for code. Yeah, it is, I was thinking that, exactly. It yeah. may only be it may only be TypeScript. I'm not really sure. Uh, TypeScript does make a lot of these kinds of things easier. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, you know, we've been doing. I mean, this 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 DSL work we've been doing started off with a, a DSL embedded in Haskell because it's a Haskell data type. Um, but we've recently embedded it in JavaScript, and that was actually it's a very pleasant experience using TypeScript. TypeScript really does help. I mean, it, it means that you can. Yeah, getting that sort of type directed advice can be really useful. Yeah, if, if you actually use it effectively, I keep getting into arguments with my colleagues about not using string types if you can avoid it. Uh, they placate the compiler, but they don't add very much value or information for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And we have all these like very obvious uh, union types that we can create and yes. I don't know. Some developers just don't want to go to the trouble, right? Well, it's an array of strings. Why isn't that good enough? Like, well, because you know that it's really not. It's actually a set of uh, countries or, you know, yes. yeah. uh, known entities that you can actually um, refine toward. Why yeah. wouldn't you do that? Like, well, I don't need it. How do you know you don't need it? This is a kind of annoying conversation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but and and yeah, unless you have a policy, then you're not going to be. Yeah. You either do, you either all do it, or nobody does it. I yeah, it's very hard to um, to see eye to eye on these things. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, your tools are solving uh, exactly this kind of problem, where if you're not all on the same wavelength, you don't have the same philosophy. There's no amount of arguing that will get you all on the same page. No, that's true. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Better to automate and devote your brain power to more interesting problems. Well, that's certainly true. Yeah. Cool. Good. Well, I might, my, my, I've been talking for long enough, I think. Yeah, I think it's a good point to conclude. I don't see any other questions. And I think this was terrific. Um, I'm really grateful that you took the time to join us. And yeah, if you do make it back to Berlin, let's do it again in person. Cool. Yeah, no, that was great. And thank you very much for listening. And I hope it wasn't I mean, I hope I wasn't re reflecting too much. I mean, I was throwing in quite a lot, but I, I wanted to, there were quite a lot of things I wanted to say. So I hope it was a, I hope it gave you food for thought at least. Absolutely. Great. And pe people in the chat are saying, thank you very much. Lots of exclamation cool. points. Okay, cool. Thanks very much everyone. And um, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, there we are. And thanks again. And yeah, have a good day. Yep, thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.